Amen. I want to remind you, um, in the upcoming week, um, Tim and I are both uh, setting out for uh, Central Asia uh, on Thursday. And so if you uh, need pastoral care or need to reach uh, somebody, I would encourage you to reach out to Pastor Andrew in the week ahead. Um, in addition, if, uh, if you have not filled out a card and you would like to send a card to Megan, um, please be sure to fill that out and give it to me before Wednesday night, because if you wait till next Sunday, you'll have to mail it there and good luck. So I would love to take that and allow that to be a great encouragement to Megan. Uh, one of the greatest encouragements for a missionary on the field is hearing from their home church, their sending church. Um, and so uh, we certainly want to encourage Megan in that way. Let me take a minute to pray, and then we'll open God's word together. Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege to gather here this morning. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we can gather here free from the persecution and the, certainly the degree of opposition that many in the early church experienced. Lord, I pray we would not take it for granted. I pray as we open your word, we would come with eager hearts and eager ears to listen to what you have to say to us by your spirit, that you would accomplish much in your people this morning for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, if you're using a pew Bible this morning, you'll find our text on page 923. Acts chapter 14, the last several weeks we've been uh, hearing about Paul and Barnabas's first missionary trip. We've been looking as, uh, at the details of what took place as they entered into uh, modern day Turkey, having left from Cyprus. And this morning we have actually come to the end we finally reach the end, the conclusion of this first missionary trip. And so I'm going to pick up reading this morning in chapter 14, verse 24. Lord willing, we'll finish the chapter this morning. Read down through verse 28. You can follow along in your copy of God's Word there. The author Luke writes these words. He says, Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Adalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. When they arrived and gathered their church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Well, for those of you who are taking notes this morning, I want to uh, give you the outline, how the text breaks down uh, this morning. You'll see the outline on the passage behind me. Kristen, if you can throw that up there. First, you see in verses 24 to 26, we're going to hear Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch. Verse 27, we'll see Paul and Barnabas report to Antioch. And then finally, in verse 28, we'll see Paul and Barnabas remain in Antioch. So the first thing we hear about in the text is Paul and Barnabas's return to their sending church in Syrian Antioch. We get the Antiochs confused a little bit. There's more than one. There's Pisidian Antioch, which was in modern-day Turkey, which is where one of the cities to which Paul and Barnabas went while they were on their trip. And then there's Syrian Antioch, which is their sending church back in Syria. This is where they return back to, according to verses 24 through 26. And there's two things I want to highlight for you in these opening three verses of our passage. The first thing I want you to see in verses 24 and 25, I want you to see a faithful finish. A faithful finish. Verse 26, we're going to see a work fulfilled. So a faithful finish and then a work fulfilled. And I want you to remember, last week we, we heard that when Paul and Barnabas, when they had preached the gospel and made many disciples in the city of Derbe, we heard that they made this decision to turn around, to retrace their steps back through the cities of Lystra and Iconium and Pisidian Antioch. And, and they made this decision even though they had experienced intense opposition in these cities. And even though returning back to these cities likely would have been at great risk to their lives, 
We heard how they made this decision even though Tarsus was on the horizon. We said Tarsus was Paul's hometown. We know that Paul had planted at least one church in Tarsus, and we know that just beyond Tarsus was the friendly confines of Syrian Antioch. And so we might have expected that if they had gone to Pisidian Antioch and then Iconium and then Lystra and Derby, they would have just continued on. But that's not what they did. We heard how they turned around and retraced their steps back through Pisidian Antioch, Lystra, Iconium. We pick up in verse 24 this morning. The author tells us that Paul and Barnabas passed through the region of Pisidia and came to the re region of Pamphylia. In other words, what the author is telling us is that these two missionaries had made it through the gauntlet of Lystra and Iconium and Pisidian Antioch. And they had once again come to the region of Pamphylia. Now, you might be sitting here this morning, and you go, I don't remember them going to Pamphylia. Well, let me refresh your memory. If you turn back a chapter, turn back to Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. This is right after Paul and Barnabas and John Mark had worked their way through the island of Cyprus. The text tells us, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, which was on the island of Cyprus, and they came to the city of Perga, which was in the region of Pamphylia. And here's what happened while they were in Perga of Pamphylia. The text says, And John Mark left them, or deserted them, and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. So you see, the last time that Paul and Barnabas were in Pamphylia, they were barely there long enough to have a cup of coffee. There's no synagogue visit that's mentioned in Perga. There's no gospel proclamation or disciple making or church planning that took place in Perga. In fact, the only notable thing about their time in Perga and Pamphylia was John Mark's desertion. Back in chapter 13, we, we didn't hear the specific reason why they spent so little time in Perga and Pamphylia. There's, there's a number of suggestions that people make as to why they just kind of skipped past Perga. Some people have suggested that Paul was, was ill when he got to Perga. In the book of Galatians, a letter that Paul would later write to these churches, chapter 4, verse 13, if you want to go and look at it later, Paul actually tells the Galatian churches, he said, I preached the gospel to you at first because of a bodily ailment. And so some have suggested that when Paul arrived in Perga, he was sick. I mean, he had crossed the Mediterranean Sea. You guys know what it's like to be seasick. Some of you maybe. Because Pisidian Antioch was at a higher altitude, the, the air was a little bit cleaner there. And so some have suggested that this is why they decided not to stay in Perga. They wanted to get to the hills of Pisidian Antioch where the air was a little better. Others have suggested the missionary's desire to move on to Pisidian Antioch had something to do with a Roman official named Sergius Paulus. Do you remember him? Sergius Paulus was the man, the Roman official, who was converted under Paul and Barnabas' preaching on the island of Cyprus. Now, archaeological evidence suggests that Sergius Paulus had family and property in the area of Pisidian Antioch. And so some have suggested, you know, maybe when Paul and Barnabas had shared the gospel with him and, and they, he understood that they were done on the island of Cyprus, maybe Sergius Paulus said, hey, I've got some family over in Pisidian Antioch. I've got some connections over there. I know the guy who leads the synagogue. I, I, I can give you the lay of the land. Some have suggested maybe that was the reason that, that when they got to modern-day Turkey, they said, you know what, we're, we're not going to start in Perga. We're going to go to Pisidian Antioch where we've got some information. Others point to the fact that there's no evidence that a synagogue existed in Perga. Well, we've heard that Paul and Barnabas had adopted a strategy, at least initially, of first visiting the synagogues of the cities that they went to. Well, if there's no synagogue in Perga, then it's hard to follow that strategy, right? And so the thought is, well, obviously there's a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. That's the closest town nearby. And so we'll start there so that we can continue on with this strategy that they had. Whatever the reason for bypassing Perga initially, we should understand that having passed through Lystra 
and Iconium and Pisidian Antioch, and having arrived safely back in Perga, listen to me, nobody knew who they were there. This was a place where if they wanted to, they could relax, and they could take it easy, and they could certainly avoid any further difficulties like they'd experienced in some other cities. Surely they could have called it quits at this point, and after all that they had been through, who would argue that they hadn't been faithful in the task that they had been sent out to do? The end of their journey was near, and they had already endured an awful lot along their journey. But I want you to look at verse 25. It says this, And when they had spoken the word in Perga, and they went down to Italia, and from there sailed to Antioch. You see, there's the faithful finish. Verses 24 and 25, that's what we see. Whatever their reason for bypassing Perga initially, they didn't have the heart to do it again. They could have said, we've, we've done enough. Someone will come back to Perga later. Our time is almost up. Our departure boat is almost here. We'll just kind of hang out here in Perga until that time arrives. They didn't do that. They finished their journey well by speaking the word in Perga. They didn't really have a good reason not to. If their reason for bypassing Perga had to do with the city not having a synagogue, well, they had seen what God could do in places that didn't have a synagogue. Lystra and Derby didn't have one either, and many disciples were made in both places. If their reason for bypassing Perga was because they wanted to go to Pisidian Antioch first, well, they had been there. They had done that. If their reason for bypassing Perga had to do with an illness that Paul was battling, well, apparently his time in the hills had done him some good. Whatever their reason for bypassing Perga the first time, with the docks in sight where their boat would soon come, where they would soon board it to go home, these two missionaries recognized my time of departure has not yet come. There is still work to be done. I have the strength to do it by God's grace, and here we have the evidence of a faithful finish to their journey. Brothers and sisters, this morning I want to encourage you to have a faithful finish like Paul and Barnabas did. You can start by having a faithful finish to this day. I'm glad that each of you have decided to start your day here. This is exactly where we should be on a Sunday morning, giving glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. But perhaps there's some things that you've bypassed already this morning. The enemy loves to stir things up on Sunday morning, doesn't he? Right before church. Maybe you're here this morning and you're here in in church and, and that's a good thing, but maybe you started this morning by speaking to someone in a way that didn't build them up and minister grace to them. Maybe you've bypassed that aspect of what the Lord has called you to do. Perhaps you spoke in a short or unkind way to someone this morning, or you spent it grumbling or complaining about something that's been going on. And if that's you, I'm sure there's plenty of reasons you could give for either one. Maybe you woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. Maybe you weren't feeling well this morning. Maybe someone cut you off on the water center or the, or the Gene Snyder or one of these other roads. I don't doubt that could have happened. Maybe as you were walking out the door, you lost your keys You got flustered about it, and you just hadn't come down from it when you walked in the door here. Whatever the reason for it, have a faithful finish to the day. If you've been short or unkind to someone, confess it. Ask that person and the Lord for forgiveness. And for the rest of the day, seek to speak in a way that honors the Lord and builds others up. If you've been in a grumbly kind of mood this morning, confess that to the Lord And ask him to help you to be thankful in every circumstance and to trust him in the midst of whatever trials you may be walking through. However you started this day, whether you started it off well or whether you didn't, have a faithful finish to it. Some of you might see the year drawing to a close. Truth be told, while you've done some things well this year, you you recognize as you sit here this morning that there are some things that have been left undone. Maybe you set out at the beginning of the year to read the Bible in a year or to start that devotional time with your family. But things happened and you bypassed that commitment. You were finally going to get organized. You were going to get some counseling 
join the church, introduce yourself to your neighbors, conquer your fear to share the gospel with the lost. Now the year is drawing to a close, the end is near, and you're tempted to think, you know, it's overall, it's been a pretty good year. I've done some good things. I'll deal with those things later, maybe next year. As Pastor Andrew memorably told us a few months ago, tomorrow is the what? The devil's day, he said. Well, if tomorrow is the devil's day, I think we could say that next year is the devil's year. However the year has started, whatever your reasons may be for how it has gone to this point, finish it well. Don't wait till the new year to do what God has presently given you the ability to do. Do it this year and have a faithful finish. Why not start that new Bible reading plan today? Or that devotional time tonight? Why not make a plan to get organized today? Why not schedule a meeting with a pastor about joining the church or getting some counseling before you leave today? Why not bake some cookies and take them to your neighbors as a way of introducing yourself this afternoon or tomorrow? Why not overcome the fear of sharing the gospel today? Whatever 2024 has looked like to this point, I want to encourage you to have a faithful finish to it. Let's be honest. For some of us, it's not just that part of the day has already passed. It's not just that a good portion of the year has already passed. For some of you, the reality is that a good portion of your time on this earth has already passed. Your journey is nearing its end. And for many of you, I know it's been a tough journey. You've worked hard. You've had some exciting moments along the way, but you've experienced some hardships, some pains, and some losses. And now as the end of your journey draws near, as the thoughts of soon departing and going home to be with Jesus become more of a reality in your mind, the world around you is telling you the end is near. You've worked hard. You've done enough. It's time to kick back and relax and enjoy the things this world has to offer. Brothers and sisters, don't listen to the world. Give yourself to things of eternal value that yield eternal rewards, not to things of temporary value that will ultimately be burned up and forgotten when Christ returns. To the degree that you're able, be like Paul and Barnabas and have a faithful finish to your journey. Don't call it quits before the time of your departure arrives. When the appointed time of your departure comes, be able to say what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, when he said, The time of my departure has now come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Until that time of your departure comes, have the mindset of the great preacher Charles Spurgeon who said, If I live to an old age, may I use my talents that I still retain and serve my blessed and faithful Lord to the final hour. By his grace, I will die with my boots on and lay down my commission only when I lay down my body. Oh, I love Charles Spurgeon, don't you? Maybe with all that you've endured and with the situation you now find yourself in, though the finish line is just ahead, you're tempted to stop running, to give yourself to other things. Brothers and sisters, don't stop running. Don't quit before the finish line. Don't kick off your running shoes, your boots, or whatever other metaphorical shoes you've been wearing along your journey. Until Jesus returns or calls you home, your course isn't over. You know, we live in an age where more and more churches seem to be shoving their older saints to the side in favor of the younger generation. But I want you to know that the older generation, and particularly those who are retired, they can be some of the most fruitful members in the local church because they have the resources and the time that the younger generation just does not. Most in that older generation can give time and support and encouragement that the younger generation cannot. 
They can be prayer warriors for the ministries and the mission of the church. They can write notes of encouragement to missionaries and pastors and church members. They can take time to cook meals to demonstrate the love of Christ to a certain family or ministry in need. Those who can drive have a special ability to meet widows and shut-ins, to follow up with visitors and to care for church members throughout the week, ministering to those in crisis at a moment's notice, quickly meeting other spiritual and practical needs. Some can even go to the mission field without having to raise a dime of support. Even in your twilight years, the Lord may provide opportunities to proclaim his name or to serve his people that you couldn't or didn't take advantage of before. My encouragement to you is this. Whatever your journey has been to this point, whatever you haven't done, whatever opportunities you haven't taken advantage of and whatever you may have missed, whatever your situation is, like Paul and Barnabas, have a faithful finish. But because we don't know when the end of the journey is, start with today. Start with this year. Have a faithful finish to it. From a faithful finish in verses 24 and 25, verse 26 speaks of a work fulfilled. A work fulfilled. When they had spoken the word in Perga, the text says that Paul and Barnabas returned to Syria and Antioch. By most accounts, it had been about two years since the church at Syria and Antioch had laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and commended them to the grace of God, which is just simply a way of saying that the church had prayed for God's power to be with them and God's protection to be over them while they were on their journey. Here in verse 26, we see Paul and Barnabas returning home. And according to the Spirit-inspired assessment of the author of the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas had done what they had been sent to do. Literally, the language here, it carries the sense that when Paul and Bar- what Paul and Barnabas had been sent to do, what they had been set apart to do, they carried it through to the end. I want to ask you, having, what do you think? Having, having faithfully finished their work, having carried it through to the end, how do you think Paul and Barnabas felt when they returned home and gave an account for their work over the last two years? My guess is they were looking forward to it. Brothers and sisters, I want the same to be true for for each of us. When your journey concludes, I want you to be looking forward to giving an account for the work that you have done. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, quoting the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or good. Or worthless. Paul isn't talking about the judgment of believers and unbelievers that has to do with salvation or condemnation. Paul is describing a judgment of believers that has to do with commendation and degrees of reward. He's describing the reality that some believers will give themselves more to worthless things along their journey. Not things that are sinful necessarily in and of themselves, but just things that are of no lasting value. Because they're in Christ, they won't be condemned. They just won't be commended to the same degree as those who have given themselves to more eternally valuable things. As those who have been united to Christ by God's grace through faith in Jesus, Ephesians 2 is clear that we've been set apart for good works that God has prepared for us to walk in. And you say, Pastor Stephen, what are some of those good works that God has prepared for me to walk in? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's three. How about participating in the work of making disciples of Jesus from every tribe, tongue, and nation, as we read in Matthew 28 in the opening chapters of the book of Acts? How about proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light through our proclamation of his word and our obedience to it, as we read in 1 Peter 2, verse 9? How about using the gifts and the abilities that God has given to us to serve his body and to build up the body of Christ as we read in Romans 12, 3 through 8. Brothers and sisters, these are the good works that we should give ourselves to, things of eternal value, things that we have been set apart for. Carry it through to the end. Forsake the worthless and temporary things of this world that have no lasting value. 
that will ultimately be burned up when Jesus returns and renews all things. When you're called home and you're contemplating the report you will give to Jesus, you certainly will not regret having given yourself fully to such things for which you have been set apart. That's enough of the return of Paul and Barnabas to Antioch. Let's turn our attention to the report of Paul and Barnabas to Antioch in verse 27. The first part of their report that we see, it's a review of what God had done with them. So not only is it an accounting of the good things that they had done, of the good works that they had been about, it's an acknowledgement of the God behind the good. God got the credits in their report. He got the glory as he should for any of the good things that his people do. Like the title of a well-known book, Paul and Barnabas saw themselves as instruments in the Redeemer's hands. And they had quite a bit to share about what the Redeemer had done with them. They had preached the good news of the gospel to Jews and Gentiles alike. They had performed multiple miracles that confirmed their message and their authority. And they had been preserved and delivered through intense opposition. I love the word there. It's, it, it says when they, when they came back in Acts chapter 14, uh, verse 27... That word, they declared all that God had done with them. It's a repeated declaration. It's an ongoing declaration. This wasn't something they just shared once. It was an ongoing thing. They had so much to share about what God had done with them. And so as they come back to the church at Syria and Antioch, I want you to understand they had come back to a church that had commended them to the grace of God. They had come back to a church that had asked that God's power would be with them and that God's protection would be over them during their journey. And now here's Paul and Barnabas returning to Antioch some two years later and reporting all that God had done in fulfillment of those prayers. God had been with Paul and Barnabas. He had powerfully worked with them and he had powerfully protected them. What a wonderful testimony from Paul and Barnabas as they returned. And what a sweet encouragement it must have been for the church at Antioch to hear how God had heard and answered their prayers that were offered at the outset of this journey. Listen, I want to say this as a quick aside. This isn't the main point of this message, but when you hear God answer prayer, share it with those around you. God hears and answers his people. And in our self-sufficient, prayer-deficient American culture, it's important that we take time to point that out to those around us. Now, as exciting as the first part of their report had been in the years of the church at Syrian Antioch, the second part was even more exciting. Here in verse 27, we see Paul and Barnabas reporting to Antioch, not just what God had done with them, but with what God had done with respect to the Gentiles. Reporting, as it says in the text, how God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. It's really interesting language. God had opened a door to the Gentiles. When you think of an open door, it's, it's an opportunity for someone to enter into that which was once off limits. We're told by the author that the door that God had opened to the Gentiles was the door of faith. So through this door of faith that God had opened, Gentiles had entered into off-limits territory. Where had they entered into? Acts chapter 13, verse 49, if you want to mark that down, says those who believed had entered into eternal life. They had entered into the kingdom of God. They had entered into fellowship with the one true and holy God, into the everlasting joy of our heavenly master. Notice these Gentiles, they hadn't entered in through the door of circumcision or law-keeping. They hadn't entered in through good works or the door of baptism. No, they had entered into God's kingdom through the door of faith. That's going to become really important when we get to chapter 15. This wasn't just faith in the general sense. Through faith in Jesus, they had entered into God's kingdom. Faith in Jesus, who fittingly referred to himself as the door. In John chapter 10, verse 9, 
who said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, the door. There's only one door into God's kingdom. It's a door that God graciously opened to the Gentiles that still remains open this morning. It's the door of faith in Jesus. God stands at that door, and he invites sinners to enter into his kingdom and to enjoy everlasting fellowship with him. How gracious. We shouldn't be allowed to enter into his presence. We shouldn't be allowed to come into his kingdom at all. It's off-limits territory. Our sin has made us absolutely filthy. Imagine showing up at a formal dinner party wearing dirty and smelly and filthy rags as your clothing. As sinners, that's what we look for. It's what we look like before a holy God. Because of our sin, we shouldn't be allowed to enter in. It's a good, good sentence to remember. Because of our sin, we shouldn't be allowed to enter in. But when we enter through this door of faith, that God has opened. We are cleansed by the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, and we are clothed in the sinless perfection of Jesus Christ. There's no other door like it. The door of good works, the door of baptism, those are doors that were put in place by the enemy. They're trap doors that lead only to misery and everlasting judgment. But you enter through the door that God has graciously opened to sinners like you and me. You enter by his grace through faith in Jesus. The Bible teaches you become an inheritor of eternal life and a rightful heir of God's kingdom. And that door remains open this morning. Soon that door is going to close. Jesus is going to re return, and on that day it'll be too late. But this morning the door remains open. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you've done, this morning God stands at the door and he graciously calls you to enter into eternal life through faith in Jesus. Come to him with all the filth of your sin, with all of your worthy, unworthiness to enter in, come and enter into eternal life and everlasting joy through faith in the Savior. Through faith in Jesus, you will be cleansed of every sin. And you will be clothed in the attire of perfect and holy righteousness that is required to dwell in the presence of a holy God for all eternity. Only through that door. There's no other door you can enter in. With the time we have left, I want to look at the last section. I want to talk with you about Paul and Barnabas remaining in Antioch. We've seen Paul and Barnabas' return to Antioch, their report to Antioch. Here in verse 28, we see them remain in Antioch. The, the text says they remain no little time with the disciples. And so they've returned from this long and arduous journey. There's a, a lengthy time, we're told, that they gathered together with God's people. There's two quick things I'd like to say with response to what we hear in this final verse, in verse 28. Number one, Paul and Barnabas needed to recharge. Their first missionary journey had come to an end, but there would be others. We'll read about them in future chapters. Their course on this earth wasn't anywhere near complete at this point. There was still important work for them to do. There were churches that needed to be built up. There were cities that needed to hear the good news and yet the text tells us that despite all of that, Paul and Barnabas remained with the disciples in Antioch for no little time. Now, they weren't kicking back and relaxing. The scriptures don't scold them for doing this. And so it has the impact of establishing this pattern for those who serve in certain ministry roles. With missionaries, we call this recharging time a furlough. Oftentimes, missionaries will come back off of the field, and they'll, they'll gather with God's people, and they'll be edified and encouraged before they're sent back out to the field. We did this with Megan just last year. With pastors, it's called a sabbatical. Following a season of faithful labor, it's a good time to recharge and regroup. Paul and Barnabas, we see they had done good work. They had made good progress. But Paul had nearly been beaten to death. He had been... He had suffered from illness. He had suffered loss. John Mark had deserted them. That had an impact. They had been through a lot. 
And so before their second missionary journey commenced, it was a good thing for them to remain some time in Antioch. Many missionary organizations, they make it a, a practice to model this for their missionaries. I think many churches like ours have made it a practice to do the same for their pastors. It was important for Paul and Barnabas to recharge. Number two, Paul and Barnabas prioritized fellowship with God's people. The text says that while they were on furlough, so to speak, they were with the disciples. This is what gave them life and refreshed their souls to be able to continue the work that God had prepared for them. Worshiping with God's people and enjoying fellowship with God's people not only was it a great blessing for Paul and Barnabas during their time back in Antioch, but it resulted in great blessing for others as well. As they gathered with believers in Antioch, we're going to hear in chapter 15 when we get there how Paul and Barnabas' presence became a great source of encouragement to the Gentile believers in that city and beyond. Paul and Barnabas had endured great difficulty for two years. And yet, we see their commitment to gathering with God's people. No doubt something that resulted in great joy for Paul and Barnabas as they recounted all that God had done with them. But it was also something that yielded great benefit to the believers that they were gathering with. And if you're a Christian here this morning, then God's design is for you to worship and fellowship regularly with his people. For your good and your refreshment and your building up, as well as for the good and refreshment and building up of others. If Paul and Barnabas prioritized this in their lives, despite the great difficulties and trials that they had endured, we should certainly do the same, no matter the difficulties and trials God may call us to endure. And so what have we heard this morning? Well, we've, we've heard about Paul and Barnabas returning home after a long and arduous journey. We've heard a favorable assessment of their journey, supported by the report they provided to those who had sent them. And we've heard that when their journey was over and they had given a report that demonstrated how by God's grace they had carried out the work for which they had been set apart, they enjoyed this long period of refreshment from their journey. And they fellowship with God's people. You know, when you think about it, Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch. It was kind of like a small, small little slice of heaven. A little foretaste of what it's going to be like when each of us complete our journey. When we go home and give a report and receive an assessment before the judgment seat of Christ. Do you know what happens after that? Our journey is going to come to an end. Whatever good we have done, we give God all the glory. Whatever rewards we receive for what we've done, we're going to cast those, I think, at the feet of Christ because we recognize that whatever good we've done is, is owing to what he's done in us. And when that's all done, we'll remain no little time in fellowship with God and his people. There will still be work to do. This can be work of a different kind. When that day comes, the door of faith will be closed. And all who trusted in Jesus by faith will see him face to face. And the Bible says we'll rule and reign with him in a new heavens and a new earth. In that place, there will be no thorns and thistles to frustrate our efforts, only the satisfaction of a job well done to the glory of God. In that place, we will finally experience the fullness of what our first parents experienced when they walked with fellowship, in fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden. We'll experience perfect love, perfect joy, perfect peace, and perfect provision in the presence of God for all eternity. That's what's coming. That's what's ahead. When your journey is complete, you'll return home. You'll give a report and you'll receive an assessment. You'll receive rewards, but you'll cast those at the feet of the, the Lord Jesus Christ because he deserves all the glory. And then you'll for no little time be in the presence of your God who fulfills all of our needs who gives us all the pleasures of heaven will reign and rule with Christ forever and so I call you this morning 
to finish your race well. Wherever you are in your journey, whatever you've done to this point, like Paul and Barnabas, leave here determined to have a faithful finish. And when your faithful Savior returns, you will not be disappointed. You will have no regrets. The fruit of our labors will end up in a joyful forever with Christ. Father, we thank you for this morning. We confess that it is easy to buy into the things that the world is calling us to do. We acknowledge that life in this fallen world is difficult. There are trials and tribulations that you permit us to walk through. Jesus promised that we would do such things. We would have such struggles. In this world, he said, you will have tribulation. But take heart, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And so, Father, in the midst of whatever trials and tribulations we may be walking through, as we see the, the journey drawing to an end, we recognize that our lives on this earth are but a fleeting breath. They could very well end in the next few hours. And so we pray, Lord, however we have started this day, help us by your grace to have a faithful finish to this day. Help us to have a faithful finish to this year. Those things that we have been set apart to do, Lord, maybe that we have overlooked or bypassed for whatever the reasons may be, help us to finish well. We pray that when we come before the Lord Jesus Christ to give our assessment, we would do so with great confidence. We would not be those who shrink back, or those who are saved, but, but through fire. Lord, that we would stand in confidence knowing that we have entered through the foundation, through the door of Christ. We have trusted in him. And when we stand on that foundation, whatever we have built on top of it that has eternal and lasting value, we look forward to the rewards that you will commend us with. But God, we give you all the glory because it's all of grace. And you called us to yourself when we were suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, when we were walking in darkness, you called us from the door. You said, enter in through faith in my son. You opened our eyes to see how your plans to save sinners have been fulfilled in him. And so, Father, we rejoice this morning. For those of us who trust in Christ, we rejoice that we have entered into your eternal presence, that we are members of the kingdom right now, and that one day we will see him face to face. And we know that whatever we do for your glory from that point forward is an operation of your grace, working through us, working with us. And it is our prayer that as we finish our race well, as you powerfully work within us and as you powerfully protect us, wherever you send us, it is our prayer that that door of faith would be revealed to many more, that many more would come to know Christ and enter into your eternal joy. And so we ask these things, not so this church would grow larger, not so that we might be able to build more or do more, or have more funds. We ask these things because you are worthy of the glory of all the nations. And so we pray that you would accomplish all of these things in us so that that end might be accomplished. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.